New study just came out this week looking at erythritol, which is a substance used as sweetener as replacement for sugar in some products. The study seems to suggest an association of cardiovascular disease with erythritol. So the media had a field day with this. CNN, ABC News, the New York Times, People Magazine, they were all over it. And predictably, there was a huge hoopla on social media, people panicking over it, etc. Some people even called it erythritol gate. Okay, that was just me. And several scientists went on social media, they tried to put out the fires and explain the caveats, the problems with the interpretation of the study, etc. So let's take a look at the study, what it found, and what it means for us. The main finding was that the blood level of erythritol correlated with cardiovascular events. So events means heart attacks and strokes. So the people with the highest level of erythritol in their blood had the most heart attacks or strokes. The main problem with that, as several scientists explained on social media, is that erythritol is produced endogenously. Our body produces it. The study even mentions this. Erythritol is endogenously produced. So measuring blood levels of erythritol doesn't necessarily tell us much about the effect of eating it. People who have higher levels might just produce more, not necessarily eat more. They might not eat any erythritol, potentially. So that's the main limitation of the study. We have no idea how much, if any, erythritol these people were eating, were actually eating, because that just wasn't measured. The study even explains that in one of their data sets, the measurements were made before erythritol started being widely used as a sweetener in processed foods. So, at least in that group, the measurement is unlikely to reflect intake. So there's a massive logical leap between what the public perceives when they read these media pieces or when they saw the pieces on CNN and all that, and what the study actually measured. Now, smart viewers might say, okay, so this study doesn't really tell us if those participants were actually eating erythritol, but if high blood levels were linked to disease, maybe we should just eat less of it to keep our blood levels low, right? That's a reasonable thought process, but here's the second problem. The erythritol production in our body responds to all kinds of disturbances. Erythritol levels go up in prediabetes, in diabetes, as a response to osmotic stress, they may respond to dietary glucose and fructose, oxidative stress, etc., etc. So the fact that people who have higher blood levels of erythritol tend to be sicker doesn't tell us if it's erythritol itself causing the problem or if it's just a marker of disease or of an unhealthy diet with a lot of refined carbohydrates or a number of other things. And if that's the case, if it's just a marker, then changing dietary levels might not do anything. We really can't tell from this type of measurement. In fact, in the study, they split the participants into four groups based on their blood level of erythritol. Group one had the lowest level, groups two and three had more, but their cardiovascular risk wasn't significantly higher than group one. Only group four, which had the highest erythritol blood levels, had significantly higher risk. But group four also had about three times more people with diabetes than group one. So again, it might just be that they're sicker to begin with and their erythritol level reflects that. It's a marker of sickness rather than erythritol itself causing heart attacks. Now, researchers aren't dumb, so they see these differences in diabetes in their data sets and they try to minimize confounders as best they can. So they adjusted statistically for diabetes, blood pressure, a few other factors, and the effect size came down substantially, was reduced, which suggests that indeed a chunk of the original effect was due to these differences in sickness. There was still a significant effect left, but it could easily be explained by some of these other factors that also affect endogenous erythritol production, like pre-diabetes, uh, bad diet, different types of stress that were not included in the adjustment models. So the main weakness of the study, and it's hard to get around it, is they're primarily looking at a marker of disease in the blood, and not necessarily at the effect of consuming, of eating erythritol. And actually, it was already known that people with higher blood levels of erythritol 
tend to have higher risk of coronary heart disease. This has been published in the literature for at least four years. And even this discussion of is the blood level of erythritol a marker of disease or does it actually cause anything, that's also published in the literature. None of this is quite brand new. So what the authors tried to do in the second part of the paper is they tried to bolster those human data by testing the effect of erythritol on some lab models. And they found that erythritol seems to promote blood clotting both in vitro, so in a test tube assay, and also in a mouse model. And the last thing they did was they got a group of eight people and they fed them some erythritol and looked at their blood levels and they confirmed that they indeed shot up very high and stayed pretty high for a couple days. So the results in the test tube and in the mice raised the possibility that eating erythritol might induce blood clotting. Is that also going to be the case in humans? Is it going to affect cardiovascular risk? In which direction? What's the net effect of intake of erythritol on cardiovascular disease? All TBD, all unclear at this point. We have to be very careful with this type of lab data in test tubes and in mice, what we call mechanistic data, because it's very common for it not to reproduce in humans. And even when it does, it's not uncommon for the same molecule to have other effects and for the net effect of the food or the treatment in a living, breathing human to be unpredictable from these lab tests in isolation. For example, there are published results also in vitro, in test tubes, or in lab animal models pointing to benefits of erythritol. Like, for example, reduced weight gain, antioxidant activity, vasoprotective effects on the endothelium, and lower glucose levels in rodent models of diabetes. So which one do we go with? The mouse result pointing to harm or the mouse result pointing to benefit? Right? This is why scientific positions on the likely health effect of a food or a treatment have to hinge on human data, what we call outcome data. Because if you run enough assays in a test tube or in a mouse in a, in a, in a laboratory, you often find results going in several different directions. And the truth is the central human data in this paper, that association between blood levels of erythritol and cardiovascular risk is not fundamentally new and it's very inconclusive. Now, according to the trial registration, which is something that scientists are supposed to do before they start a trial, you're supposed to submit a description of what you're going to do. And according to that, they also tested the clotting effect in their human subjects. But that data didn't end up in the paper. It wasn't published. I'm not going to speculate on why, but if they publish it at a later date, that could add a bit more information. So there is some uncertainty with these products, especially long term, consuming them for decades at a very high dose. We don't really know everything that happens. And it's good to acknowledge areas of uncertainty, but we should avoid jumping to conclusions and making these categorical claims that are not backed by evidence. There was basically a stampede on social media, people essentially pulling their hair out even people with some scientific training, some medical doctors, making just bizarre claims. I saw some people, not going to name names, but I saw some people saying, this proves cause and effect between eating erythritol and cardiovascular disease. The intake of erythritol wasn't even uh, assayed, wasn't even measured in the population where cardiovascular risk was reported. Others telling all their followers to drop everything with erythritol, because this study proves that it causes cardiovascular disease. I even saw people saying that we don't need any more research. We don't need trials. This settles it. Eating erythritol causes heart attacks. Case closed. That's completely divorced from scientific reality. At a broader scale, I've noticed a pattern on social media with these waves where people will basically decide that a food is terrible for you with little to no scientific evidence to back it up and then just repeat it on loop until everybody's very emotional and very angry about it and especially upset if something is questioned or if evidence is shown to the contrary. And then some time goes by and the wave dies down and it moves on to another food, right? But the whole time, the scientific evidence 
on that food that was focused on during the wave barely changed. I saw this with lectins five years ago. I've seen it with different types of oils. And now it seems to be about these artificial or alternative sweeteners. It's fashionable to say that they're bad for you with or without the evidence, right? Everybody on Instagram and TikTok is repeating the same thing. And a year or two from now, it's gonna be another food. I don't have a dog in this fight. Don't really care about these sweeteners one way or the other. More than happy to come on and tell people to dump them if and when the science points to it. But most of this mobbing and this repetition that I see on social media does not reflect the current science. We can and we should acknowledge areas of uncertainty without the wild overclaims. Take this study, for example. It's compatible with pretty much any scenario. It's compatible with erythritol being harmful. It's compatible with it being harmless. If the blood levels are just a marker of disease, that explains the association and the mouse data might not pan out in humans. It's even compatible with benefit of erythritol. For example, there are some small pilot trials where they took some diabetic people and they gave them erythritol and several of their cardiometabolic markers improved. Their glucose levels came down, their hemoglobin A1C and blood pressure, those that had the highest blood pressure, that came down as well. So we could hypothesize benefit of eating erythritol based on the available evidence. And it wouldn't be unreasonable as a hypothesis, not as a claim, right? So the next time you see the scary headlines or people losing it on social media, bear in mind, we have to look at all of the available evidence on a topic, not just the study that just came out this week. It's pretty rare that an individual study flips a field. It's much more common that people just overreact. Some studies that could actually push this forward a lot, randomized trials, especially long-term, that'd be great. Good cohort studies, uh, measuring actual intake of the sweetener, not just blood levels, which is harder to interpret, especially for a molecule that's produced endogenously. And genetic studies, Mendelian randomization could be interesting as well. In the meantime, what do we do in real life? For people who have pretty healthy diets with not a lot of added sugars or processed foods or sweeteners, no reason to add them. That's kind of obvious. But then again, that's not the target audience. These products are designed to replace regular old school sugar added to drinks or in sodas or in processed foods. And the existing evidence is pretty compelling that they outperform regular sugar or sugar sweetened drinks when it comes to weight maintenance and metabolism. So I would recommend a diet soda over a regular soda easily for people who are gonna have one of them anyway. And in the long run, until we know more, if you wanna gradually phase out the sodas and the processed foods altogether, that's probably a safer bet, and not just because of sweeteners. Several viewers have told me they prefer stevia, sometimes perceived as being more natural, whether it really is or not is debatable, but yeah, I don't see a problem with picking that over another option. There will probably be studies in the future that will fundamentally change our confidence in sweeteners one way or the other towards safety or harm. But in my opinion, this study that just came out doesn't do that. It doesn't really change much. Here's our previous video on sweeteners for more detail. I hope that all helps. I'll see you guys soon.